good evening everyone to our today's webinar the corona virus pandemic has halted the normal life and the people across the globe are fighting it and accepting the new normal in this times of crisis hope can be a powerful source of reassurance we have always held to the hope the belief the conviction that there is a better life a better world beyond the horizon with this hope that the god will be with us all the way through and the world will survive this pandemic i richa arora from department of microbiology scottish church college on behalf of our scottish family welcomes you all to day 1 of our national webinar clinical and molecular aspects of SARS-CoV-2 and its implications on the current pandemic organized by the Department of Microbiology Scottish Church College in collaboration with IQSC Before we go further I would like to request all of you to please keep your microphones on mute and your cameras on off mode Please pin the presentation on the screen for uninterrupted viewing throughout the session and do not present or share any screen during the lecture if you have any questions or queries you are requested to write them in the chat box at the end of the lecture we will have a question answer session to discuss the same those who have joined us via youtube live streaming Please furnish your name and institution's name in the live chat section and if you have any queries you can write them in the same chat section. A feedback link will be provided to you at the end of the seminar and you are requested to fill in the link and submit it by 12 tonight. Now without further ado I would like to request our principal ma'am Dr Arpita Mukherjee to kindly deliver the inaugural speech Good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome to this national webinar on clinical and molecular aspects of SARS-CoV-2 its implication on the current pandemic organized by the IQAC and Department of Microbiology of Scottish Church College Kolkata I extend a special welcome to both our respected resource persons. The lecture today is by Dr. Indranil Banerjee, Assistant Professor and Nodal Officer, COVID-19 Testing Cellular Virology Lab, Department of Biological Sciences, IISER Mohali. The second speaker who will be addressing us around the same time on Saturday, 4th July, is Dr. Orindam Moitro, Associate Professor, National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Kollani. We have participants from across India and from Ireland, and each one of us is sitting in our secure zone, protected from the invisible virus that we are about to learn more about. It has baffled scientists and surrounds us with a constant fear of the unknown as we tide through unprecedented times new words have been coined to express new concepts and aspects of social behavior that have become a part of our lives new covid-19 words and phrases like germophobes asymptomatic containment zones ppe and social distance speak about a new normal that we have all been compelled to accept scientists are trying to fathom the truth about this rapidly mutating virus in order to discover the right vaccine to defeat it i'm sure you're all eagerly waiting to learn more about the clinical and molecular aspects of the SARS CoV-2 so without further ado i pass on the screen to our vice principal dr supratim das to say a few words thank you for your attention 
Good evening, dear friends, dear participants, and this webinar's esteemed speakers. We are currently in the midst of a global COVID-19 pandemic. By this time, we have known that uh, pandemic actually means a huge epidemic which affects a very wide range of population and which affects regions, countries, continents or which may happen globally. To the best of my knowledge, the word pandemic was first used in 1666 and then it was used as endemic or rather as a vernacular disease. Nearly two centuries later, it was the well-known American epidemiologist and lexicographer Noah Webster who referred to the word pandemic in his first edition of Webster's Dictionary and he listed pandemic and epidemic as synonymous terms. The most important thing to my mind about pandemic is that it grows very fast. It emerges in a very little way, but grows very fast. During the pandemic, all health service professionals, they would always like to see a significant change in the day-to-day -day behavior of the population. And that is perhaps a very big challenge for the health service professionals because as we see in our country also, pandemic is very much related to the world of popular perception also. Doctors are today saying that it is not just a challenge to combat coronavirus. It is equally a challenge to change popular perception and to change people's behavior. It has been a bigger challenge today because we are living in a digital age and Official versions are being distrusted because there are so many other versions on the internet. And according to who I am quoting, human behaviors nearly always contribute to the spread of a pandemic. Therefore, information to the public acquires the status of a control intervention with a great potential to reduce transmission. Unquote. Pandemic involves so many other things. It affects our morals, our values, and most importantly, today it is worst hitting global economy. We know about the Spanish flu of 1918-19, as a result of which the death toll from the First World War rose significantly. People expected that after the First World War, the world would be safe for democracy. 
but instead in the post first world war era we saw the rise of fascism and different kinds of totalitarianism the question is will there be a repeat of history in the post covid 19 period we do not know the answer but already there are signs that in the post covid 19 era there may be a lack of global cooperation and there may be a rise of nationalism narrow nationalism populism and different kinds of reactionary prejudiced political ideologies so friends today's discussion will definitely address some other issues but i would like to remind you all that coronavirus we all know it has come to stay and along with it many other new things will stay in this world to which we have to adjust if we have to live and live together thank you thank you ma'am thank you sir for your kind words now i would like to request dr shejuti haldar head department of microbiology to give a brief introduction of to a very good evening to our distinguished speaker for today dr indranil banerji our respected principal dr rokita mukherjee our respected vice principal dr shubhrotim das iqsc coordinator dr samrat bhattacharji and all the participants who have joined today's webinar via gmeet link and youtube live stream our national webinar clinical and molecular aspects of sars cov2 its implication on the current pandemic organized by department of microbiology in collaboration with internal quality assurance cell scottish church college has been organized to discuss and throw some light on the clinical and genomic aspect of this virus and its implication on the current scenario towards the end of 2019 that is december 2019 the world woke up to the reality of the pandemic of covid-19 in the last two decade it this is the third deadliest coronavirus pandemic following sars and mars this disease has brought our life to a standstill forcing us to stay indoor and practice social distancing many large number of people have been rendered homeless and they are battling hunger and suffering from malnutrition hence extensive research is the ideal way forward which will lead to characterization of the virus and possible development of vaccine to eradicate or control the disease and throwing insights on how we could prepare for and prevent the next pandemic as we all know our seminar is com has two days two sessions the today is the first session and the second session is on 4th of july our today's speaker is dr indranil banerjee he is assistant professor cellular virology lab department of biological science izar mohali he is also the nodal officer for covid 19 testing and he is also an alumnus of our prestigious institution dr banerjee will speak on the emerging crisis related to this pandemic our second speaker 
who will be speaking on 4th of July 2020, that is day after tomorrow, is Dr. Orindo Moitro. He is Associate Professor at National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Faculty in Charge, Core Technologies Research Initiative, and Project Coordinator of International Cancer Genome Consortium, India Project. Dr. Moitro will be speaking on the molecular and genoming aspects of SARS-CoV-2. I hope both the sessions will be highly beneficial for all our participants and the sessions will be able to answer many of your queries. I wish our webinar a great success. Good evening everyone. I am highly privileged to introduce our distinguished guest, Dr. Indranil Banerjee, who is also an alumnus of our prestigious institution. Dr. Banerjee presently is working as an assistant professor and leading the Cellular Virology Division of Department of Biological Sciences, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Mohali. At the same time, he is serving the role of Nodal Officer of Co for COVID testing. Dr. Banerjee completed his bachelor degree with honors in zoology from Scottish Church College in 2001. He then obtained his master's degree in zoology from Banaras Hindi University. He then obtained his master's of technology degree from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, in biosciences and bioengineering. He did his doctoral research from Institute of Biochemistry, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Switzerland from the, Switzerland, from the lab of Professor Ari Hellenius. He also obtained his postdoctoral degree from the same. From 2017, Dr. Banerjee has been acting as Novartis Presidential Fellow from Novartis Mischer Institute for Biomedical Research, Switzerland. Dr. Banerjee became recipients of a number of prestigious awards and fellowships like Pfizer Research Award, STARS Grant from Government of India, Presidential Fellowship from Novartis Pharma AG, and many more. He has also patented a new treatment against influenza virus in 2014. Dr. Banerjee has a number of publications in eminent journals like Science, Nature, Class 1, etc. He is also serving as a guest editor of the journal Frontiers in Microbiology. Today, we are highly fortunate to have Dr. Banerjee with us. So, without wasting any more time, I would hand over the session to Dr. Banerjee for, for enriching us with his valuable lecture. Thank you. Scottish Church College for inviting me for this special uh, webinar. And uh, time has really changed because of COVID and usually we used to give seminars where we meet people, meet students, meet faculty, but now the time has totally changed so that we have switched to the mode of uh, webinar. And I would uh, like to extend my thanks to Dr. Sejuti Haldar, Dr. Tina Mukherjee, the principal of uh, Scottish Church College. And of late I have received so many invitations for webinars and this one I really could not say no because uh, of a very special reason that I'm also an alumnus of this college. And uh, presently I'm based in Isa Mohali. I'm a faculty here, I'm a group leader of a, of, of a lab uh, named uh, Cellular Virology Lab. We are primarily working on uh, human pathogenic viruses, including the respiratory virus influenza where uh, we, we are currently focused on. So um, today's my topic is COVID-19, although I'm, I want to make uh, it very clear that currently we are not working on COVID-19, but we have plans to work on COVID-19 in future. And uh, since I'm working uh, with uh, human pathogenic viruses, it is almost not possible for me to go away from uh, the current uh, crisis. And, uh, but here in this presentation, I'd like to make it or like to present it in a very general way so that uh, people from different backgrounds uh, can understand the very basics of uh, COVID-19 or the infection process of SARS-CoV-2. So the title of my talk is, let me present here. Uh, now going to the presentation, uh, you can all see the screen, right? 
Yes, sir. It's very okay. much visible. Okay. All right. Very good. So the title of my today's talk is Coronavirus Crisis. Are we seconds closer to the midnight of the doomsday clock? I'm sure that we all know of, about the doomsday clock and uh, the large or the big hand of the clock is being pushed towards the midnight uh, because of uh, several reasons. It could be the atmospheric changes, global warming. Uh, and one of the reasons that this hand is being pushed towards midnight is uh, emerging infectious diseases. And as we all know, we are going through a very difficult phase, that is the COVID-19 crisis. Now, I'll start about uh, this COVID-19, uh, showing a couple of images which are really heart-wrenching. Uh, as you can see here, these are two females. One is a mother with a caregiver, a nurse probably in a COVID-19 hospital. This, this photographs were taken in China. And she is, and uh, the other side, right hand side, you can see uh, a young girl uh, crying for her mother. But the pity is the virus, this deadly virus, has put a long distance between them. And so the mother and the daughter are with open hands to hug each other, but they are unable to hug because of the crisis that we are going through. And she's saying that I'll be back home once the virus is beaten. And although the little girl is crying, but uh, she is very proud and confident that her mother would someday beat the virus. That's what she is telling. My mom is fighting monsters. And there's another photograph. Maybe you have all uh, uh, seen this photograph. Uh, of a very old couple who are holding each other's hands. And probably this was their last meeting because they're very old and they're all both a coronavirus positive. This photograph was taken long back uh, on February 4, 2020. So what was the history? So here the history goes that we all know that the virus broke out from uh, an uh, animal market in the province of Wuhan in China. And in uh, December, uh, a very young doctor, Li Wenliang, uh, first cautioned the world that a deadly virus is going to come very soon. So he was uh, treating some patients and he could sense that uh, they were showing symptoms like SIRS. So people did not believe him at the first place, and the people uh, thought that uh, he is uh, being very provocative, he is being unnecessarily uh, very cautious. He is, uh, uh, so people in general did not take him uh, quite uh, seriously. And uh, which was even worse was that the Chinese government uh, was uh, very antagonistic against him. And he was accused of making false comments uh, that severely disturbed the social order. That's what the Chinese uh, administration claimed. But we know the consequence of it. And uh, uh, so he was eventually uh, diagnosed with coronavirus on 30th January. And unfortunately, he succumbed to uh, this infection on February 7th. I gave one uh, webinar on May 8th, very recent. I'm not going back to, say, January or February. And May is uh, very recent, too. And worldwide, the coronavirus cases was around 39 lakhs. And there are 2,71,000 deaths or 72,000 deaths. In India, the situation was like this. 57,000 odd people were infected, and out of them, around 1,900 people died. But the scenario has completely changed over the last couple of months. And now this is uh, what you see. About one crore people all over the world are infected, and more than five black people died. And in India, these numbers are simply skyrocketing. So more than six lakh people are diagnosed with this virus, and there has been more than 17,000 deaths. So we are currently in a very alarming situation. 
When you talk about the case fatality rate, there are different uh, viruses which uh, were pandemic. Uh, we all know that Ebola, MERS, MERS stands for Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome Virus, smallpox, SARS, SARS-CoV-2, measles, and seasonal flu. Many doctors argue that SARS is nothing. It's, it's, it's uh, like flu only. But here I'd like to disagree completely because the case fatality rate of seasonal flu is about 0.1%. And here goes the SARS-CoV-2, 6.9%. That means this virus is 69 times deadlier than seasonal flu. However, you might argue that uh, this is not the most uh, devastating virus because we have examples of Ebola, MERS, or smallpox, SARS, which are even more devastating, right? Uh, I'll come to this slide where you can see that the MERS uh, fatality rate was 34%, SARS was 9.6%, but SARS-CoV-2 was 6.9%. But so why is SARS-CoV-2 so dangerous? Now, if you look at the, if, if you do a comparison among MERS, SARS, and SARS-CoV-2, uh, as per the cases and the number of deaths. So this data is from May. I have not updated it. But as you can see here, uh, for eight years, MERS uh, has been around in, 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 throughout the world, uh, specifically concentrating in the Middle Eastern regions. Uh, MERS was first detected in 2012, but it's still continuing. But it is not as contagious as SARS-CoV-2 is. The total number of cases of MERS was 2,519, and out of uh, uh, those infected, uh, only 866 people died. And SARS was detected much earlier in 2002, 2003, but this virus was successfully contained. SARS had a, a, a high contagiousness as compared to MERS. It uh, infected about uh, 8,000 people. And out of this 8,000 people, 774 uh, people died. But in case of the new SARS, so the SARS-CoV-2, or the novel coronavirus, this is simply skyrocketing. This does not match the, uh, the number of cases and the number of deaths. Uh, if you compare it to SARS and MERS, Despite the fact that they have the SARS-CoV-2 has a lesser case fatality rate as compared to SARS or MERS, the, the magnitude of devastation is simply uh, uh, massive. Okay, so uh, this is a case fatality rate estimates of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 between age and sex. As you can see here, that both these factors, age and sex, uh, uh, make uh, people uh, more susceptible. So if you're male, then you're more susceptible to this virus and uh, more uh, susceptible uh, to succumb to this virus. That is uh, more susceptible to death. For example, those who are more than 90 year old, uh, in case of males, the fatality rate is about 32%. And those who are, say, 30 to 39, they're relatively safer. The case fatality rate is about 0.43. But if you compare males and females, uh, the males seem to be more susceptible, more uh, prone uh, to contracting the disease, and uh, they are more vulnerable. And this is true for the all age bands. Okay, now coming to uh, how COVID-19 kills. So we are all interested in uh, how, what is the pathophysiology of the virus, how the virus enters uh, our body, and what does it do? So here are the uh, basic symptoms of coronavirus. I'm pretty sure that we are all familiar with the symptoms that uh, if you contract coronavirus, the first thing that you'd have is a cough, uh, shortness of breath, uh, a high fever, and breathing difficulty. And uh, sometimes it's also associated with gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, initial few days after infection, uh, there's hardly any symptom. That is very deadly. And this phase is called asymptomatic. And during the asymptomatic, uh, many people uh, pe uh, previously believed that uh, you are not shedding the virus. That is, you are not infecting uh, other people. 
but this is not true. Recent research uh, uh, has revealed that even in the asymptomatic state, uh, people can shed viruses. But as the virus progresses with its infection uh, from day five to 10, uh, one shows the symptoms. But in most of the cases, the symptoms remain mild. Even hospitalization is not required for the people who have uh, mild uh, corona symptoms. But around 5 to 10% of the cases reach the severe level. And in severe cases, uh, we have pneumonia, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, and kidney failure. And finally, death. So those who are going to the severe stage of the infection, uh, they're more vulnerable uh, to death. Coming to treatment, I'll, I'll discuss more about the treatments. Uh, so I'm just telling you there's no vaccine or antiviral drugs uh, still available which are approved. There are many in clinical trials, uh, but uh, they're not yet approved. So I'll, I'll detail on it uh, later in my presentation. So, so the symptoms can be treated. So it is called the symptomatic treatment. So uh, what can be uh, done if the patient comes to the hospital of late, I visited uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, facilities in, in Chandigarh, uh, in, in PGI Chandigarh. Uh, so what the doctors are doing, they are just giving uh, a symptomatic uh, treatment to the patients, but nothing else. Some doctors are trying out some antivirals very vaguely but without any uh, scientific rationale. Now coming to what is SARS-CoV-2 and why it is called SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 is a very tiny virus. So as you can see here, uh, this is uh, a representation, uh, an artificial representation of the virus. And this virus belongs to the order Nidovirales and family coronaviridae. That's why it has uh, again its name, uh, the coronavirus. Why? Because when you look at the electron microscope, this virus, the, the spike glycoproteins of the virus, appears like a crown. Uh, that's why the virus is called the coronavirus. And the, there are different uh, genesis of this coronaviruses, but uh, the virus that we are dealing with right now belongs to the beta coronavirus. The alpha coronavirus, the gamma coronaviruses are there. Some affect animals, some affect humans. But the uh, most contagious uh, human pathogenic coronaviruses belong to this genus, beta coronavirus. So coming to structure, it's an envelope virus. What is an envelope? Envelope is a lipid. It's, it's a lipid covering on the shell of the virus. I'll show you a sectional view of the virus. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, this red dots are the spike glycoproteins and the spike glycoproteins are not directly attached to the core of the virus. So they are anchored on a lipid membrane. And on the lipid membrane, there are other viral proteins too. I'll uh, come to them uh, one by one. And mostly this virus is spherical in shape and they do not show much pleomorphism as been observed in other uh, viruses, say influenza. So influenza uh, is, uh, are mostly spherical, but sometimes they can also uh, become tubular. Zika is a spherical virus, but Ebola is a tubular virus. So there are some pleomorphisms in a viral structure uh, across uh, different uh, viruses, but uh, majority of the SARS coronaviruses are spherical in shape. And there's a peculiarity of their genome. So virus, as you can see, it's, it's nothing. It's, 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 it's a bundle of uh, proteins, uh, lipids, and uh, genetic material, right? It, is, it has nothing to do with metabolism. It, it has no capacity uh, to replicate itself uh, if it is not inside a host cell. So it's inert. It's an inert mass of lipid, protein, and genetic materials. And the genetic material could be a DNA or RNA. In case of SARS-CoV-2, the genetic material is RNA. And it's a positive sense RNA. 
The structure of the virus is made up of uh, five structural proteins and 16 non-structural proteins. So what are structural proteins? So structural proteins are the proteins which are present in a virion. And what are non-structural proteins? Non-structural proteins are the proteins which are not present in the virion, but present in the viral genome. Once the virus enters a cell and starts the transcription and replication, these non-structural proteins are produced and they perform several uh, functions inside the cell. But when the virus is being packaged, the non-structural proteins are not integrating. They are not uh, coming into the virus particles to be packaged and budded off. So coming to the first protein of interest, that is a spike glycoprotein or the S protein that is here uh, uh, shown in the uh, red cartoon. And uh, this is trimer. And then comes the hemagglutinin esterase dimer. Then comes the M protein and the E protein. So these proteins are visible on the surface of the virus. But what is there inside? This is a cross-sectional view of the virus. Of course, this is a cartoon. This is not an electron microscopic image. As you can see here, uh, the spike glycoproteins and other proteins, which uh, I, I already described, they are anchored on the lipid membrane. But inside the virus, you can see a single viral genome, which is extremely large in size. Large in size means in terms of viruses. In the scale of viruses, uh, this uh, genome is one of the largest genomes. And this is a single stranded and a single RNA molecule. And the size of the genome is about 30 to 32,000 bases. Uh, so as you can see here, this is the RNA. And the RNA is not uh, present as a naked entity inside the viral core. So to give protection to RNA, there's another protein called the N protein, which the RNA is associated with. Very much like the histone proteins, uh, which, are, uh, which are wrapping around our DNA. Right, so it's, it's very similar but uh, it gives the structural integrity and protection to the viral genome. Okay. So coming to the life cycle of SARS coronavirus, what, what does it do? How does it enter the cell? And what, uh, what is the overall function? I'm not going into the details here. As you can see here, this, is a, this blue uh, uh, stuff is, is a cell. And inside the cell, there's an orange thing, which is a cell nucleus. And as you can see here, the SARS coronavirus is orange too. And when the SARS coronavirus uh, hovers, so it, it tries to scan the different cells. And whenever it finds a receptor on this a host cell, it anchors to it. All right? So this is called the virus binding on the cell surface. It cannot bind the lipid membrane. It has to find its partner, that is a protein. In case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, this protein is called S2, or angiotensin-converting enzyme 2. Whenever the virus finds this uh, molecule, this surface protein, it gets anchored. Then it is taken up inside the cell by a process called endocytosis. For those who do not know what endocytosis is, endocytosis is a process by which the ligands or the stuff which are there outside, they are taken inside by a lipid bubble. So the cell membrane in vaginates and it takes in whatever is bound, uh, whatever ligand is bound to the receptor. So it's called receptor-mediated endocytosis. So this process is called endocytosis. And what happens when an endocytosed particle uh, goes inside the cell? The endosomes are not static objects. They are highly mobile. And uh, when the virus is engulfed uh, by the process of endocytosis, the first endosome is called the early endosome. But the early endosome then moves towards the cell interior. And as it moves towards the cell interior, so it cannot move on itself. So it has to depend on molecular proteins uh, or molecular motors, uh, dynein and kinesin. And dynein and kinesin also needs superhighways, which are called microtubules. So as the endocytosed viruses travels towards the 
cell anterior, uh, the endosomes are also in turn maturing. From early endosome, then they turn into lead endosome. And what is the peculiarity of lead endosome? The peculiarity is there are some proton pumps uh, on the endosomal membranes. They become activated. And what happens then? There's an influx of protons inside the lead endosomal compartment. Why I'm describing this uh, to you? Because this is a very, very important aspect of, uh, uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and some other viruses which follow the endocytic route. So upon uh, exposure of uh, acidic environment inside the lead endosomal compartment, the spike glycoproteins of this virus undergoes a conformational change, which allows the virus to fuse with the endosomal membrane. Repeat, but I, uh, just remember what I've uh, said all, earlier, that this virus has a lipid membrane. And inside the lipid membrane, there's a viral core. There's a virus capsid. And inside the capsid is the virus. Uh, to make progeny viruses. That is the very objective of the virus. So virus is a very inert mass when it is outside the cell. So when it is going inside the cell, it has to discover some mechanism by which it can inject uh, its uh, a, a viral genome into the cytosol. And one of the strategies that this virus exploits uh, within the host cell is this receptor mediated endocytosis in which the virus finally comes to an endosome uh, whose environment is totally acidic. And this acid environment uh, makes or induces a conformational change of the spike glycoproteins. And what happens then, the spike glycoproteins help the lipid membrane of the virus to fuse with the endosomal membrane. So the fusion happens between the lipid membrane and the endosomal membrane. And that allows the penetration uh, of the viral genome. So here, as you can see now, that the viral genome has come out of the endosome. What happened if the virus uh, uh, stayed uh, for an indefinite time in this uh, endosomal compartment? So as I told you, the endosome, uh, endosomes are highly motile. They're moving inside the cell. So the endosomes will finally fuse with lysosome, right? And once the endosome is fused with the lysosome, it's called endolysosome, then the lysosomal enzymes will digest the virus. This is not the objective of the virus. The virus wants to escape the endosomal, endolysosomal uh, fusion event. So just at the lead endosomal stage, the virus machinery has evolved in such a way that it allows the fusion of the viral membrane with the endosomal membrane so that the, only the viral genome can come out. Right? And after the viral genome is uh, released to the cytosol, uh, what follows is replication and transcription of the genome. And uh, then the viral proteins are synthesized by the process of translation. And uh, then the translated proteins go through a processing in Golgi. And also the involved ER, I'll come to that later. And uh, the viral proteins, new viral proteins are synthesized and virus has hijacked the entire machinery of the cell. And now the virus is uh, making its own proteins and these proteins are now getting assembled on the, on, the, on the host cell membrane. As you can see here, this is the assembly process happening. So the spike glycoproteins are just trying to go to the uh, membranes, uh, uh, plasma membrane. So they're on the plasma membrane. The viral core proteins are assembling just beneath the plasma membrane, and the viral genome is getting associated uh, with the uh, core proteins. And finally, the process of budding is taking place, and many progeny viruses are released or shedded into the environment or into in the cellular vicinity. Right? So this is an electron micrographic image of uh, the coronaviruses which are budding from the cell surface. Uh, and this is a video. I can show the video to you. Like this is, this is the cultured cells. 
and you see the cultured cells are turning black. Why they're turning black? Because uh, more and more viruses are produced, and you can see uh, uh, it is followed by apoptosis or programmed cell death. So if the host cell becomes overwhelmed with the viral load, then uh, what follows is a programmed cell death. Most of the cells uh, die off, and the viruses are released in the uh, culture. So these are cultured cells. Okay, so I already described that uh, the process of endocytosis uh, as how the viruses uh, uh, enter the cell and uh, how they escape uh, the endosomes and how they assemble. And I'm not going into the details uh, because the audience, I guess, would be very general. Uh, so here you can see the Orpheum or, 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 or the uh, viral genome and uh, which proteins uh, they make. So there is ORF A and B, and for ORF one, uh, sorry, one A and one B, they make uh, some proteins called PL pros, three CL pros. So these are very important proteins because uh, many of the drugs are currently being developed against these proteins. All right, and. The rest of the genome is making the viral non-structural proteins. What is very interesting and typical of SARS-CoV-2 is that in the infected cells, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, induces a formation of a very special structure. So this structure is a lipid structure, which is which the virus borrows from uh, endo endoplasmic reticulum. As you can see here, there are some DMVs or double membrane vesicles which are bound to the endoplasmic reticulums. And uh, these are rough, mostly rough endoplasmic reticulum. As you can see here, there are many uh, uh, ribosomes on these uh, structures. And uh, this is very typical of uh, SARS-CoV-2. It is not seen in other viruses which uh, uses uh, other viruses which use uh, some endostatic route of entry. And this special structure is a site where the viruses uh, process all the proteins and uh, they use this as a virus factory. So in this specialized structure, the viruses uh, make several proteins and several proteins aggregate and uh, the viral uh, genome, that is the RNA, is also taken uh, up by the DMVs or the double membrane vesicles. And majority of the assemblage of the viral particles are taking place here. So this is very typical of SARS-CoV-2. So uh, I'm talking about the cellular immunity. Uh, this virus is similar with several non-structural proteins, which uh, I uh, briefly uh, described. And uh, some of the structural proteins are also there. Uh, what they do, I'm not going into the details, I'm just showing that how complex the entire system is uh, in terms of uh, immune evasion by the virus. So there are different viral proteins uh, which work on a different immune molecules. Uh, let me not go into the details. For example, the type 1 interferons or RIG1, MDF5, uh, PRKRA. Uh, MABS. MABS is a protein which is associated with mitochondrion and uh, a different, uh, uh, and uh, usually with, with the viral infection. The MABS uh, is uh, activated and it in turn activates the E3 ubiquitin ligases and kinases. Uh, but what is uh, very apparent in this uh, particular uh, diagram is that many viral proteins are inhibiting uh, this innate immune responses. Uh, uh, by blocking the activity of the antiviral factors. I'm not going to do the molecular details here. It will be too much for this uh, webinar. So now the question is uh, whether uh, this virus is lab engineered or it's naturally occurring. There's a huge debate uh, that went on for last uh, five, six months, and uh, some scientists are still uh, not convinced that it is a naturally occurring virus. But here, I'd like to differ based on whatever limited knowledge of virology that I have. Uh, so to begin with, first, let us compare uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, with the other SARS virus. 
So there's a paper published in uh, uh, Cell Hoster Micros, which is a very good journal, that showed that there has been 380 amino acid substitutions and 27 protein sequences of SARS-CoV-2. So what they did, they sequenced the genome of uh, SARS virus, the previous SARS virus that broke out in 2002-2003, and they compared it with the uh, genome of the circulating SARS virus, that is the SARS-CoV-2. And what they have found is a striking difference between these two viral uh, strains. Okay, so there are 380 amino acid uh, mutations which are identified over 27 proteins, which is huge. And uh, so my point is, like, if one tries to engineer a virus, uh, then they do not tweak so much with the viral genome because. Uh, the more we you tweak with the viral uh, genome by uh, making site-directed mutagenesis, mostly the viruses which come out of uh, the uh, mutated versions uh, or mutations are not fit to infect uh, host cells. So one of the reasons uh, most of the scientists think that this virus uh, uh, appeared naturally because they are huge difference in the structure, or, or sorry, the, the uh, sequences uh, when compared to uh, its predecessor, that is the SARS virus. And another paper which got published a couple of months ago in Nature Medicine showed that uh, the virus has a spike protein, right? And there are some mutations in the spike protein. And these mutations are seen in the human SARS-CoV-2. So you can see at the bottom of uh, the sequence uh, alignments uh, in bat and also in pangolin, but not in other bats or not in the first SARS, that is the SARS-CoV or SARS in general. And there's also an inclusion of a polybasic cleavage side, which is only present in this virus. So this, uh, two uh, aspects uh, or peculiarities of this virus uh, make us believe that this virus is uh, a naturally occurring virus or this originated from uh, some natural reservoirs. By the way, so natural reservoir of uh, the, this viruses are bats. But we have to keep in mind the bat coronaviruses cannot infect humans directly. So here, I'm just talking about the origin. So this is the origin of all the coronaviruses. Uh, that's a bat. But the bat coronaviruses are do not have uh, the mutations or the changes required to infect the final host. That's a human. They cannot jump directly from bat to human. So there is some misconception uh, at the very beginning of the SARS-CoV-2 that the Chinese people uh, eat uh, or drink uh, bat soup. Uh, so this is how the humans contract it. This is wrong. Uh, it has been shown pretty clearly that uh, SARS, the first SARS, first came in civet cats. All right. So from bat, they infected civets, and from civets, civets serve as a mixing vessel where the reassortment of the viruses took place. And finally, from uh, civet cats, this virus jumped to humans. And that's also true for the MERS coronavirus. Here, uh, the intermediate host was a camel. And what is being speculated that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 first got infected in pangolins, and from pangolins, it uh, jumped to humans. There's some debate uh, on the origin or, or the pangolin as an whether the pangolin is an intermediate host or not, but there's evidence that the viruses of which are uh, isolated for pangolins show high degree of similarity uh, to the coronavirus that uh, is uh, circulating nowadays. So coming to conclusion, that uh, there's no scientific evidence that supported that SARS-CoV-2 uh, was lab-made. 
And uh, okay, I can skip this. Uh, uh, okay, so I can very briefly describe what this slide is. So the virus is mutating, right? The virus is mutating in bats so that it can jump to an intermediate host. It can be a, a camel or a cavet, uh, the sorry, civet cat or, or a pangolin, or there could be other additional hosts which are unknown. And finally, they come to humans. But what about humans? Can humans be a mixing vessel for different coronaviruses? Can humans be a site in which the coronaviruses can mute it? And this slide shows, this is, a, this is, a, this is an Indian study, uh, which was done by uh, uh, one of the alumni of Scottish Hitch College, Nidhan Biswas, and uh, uh, Professor Parthapratha Mazumdar in Kalyani. So they published, what they did, they did all the sequence analysis of all the different viruses, or different coronaviruses. And what they found is that this virus is mutating in humans at an extremely high speed. So they sequenced about 3,600 uh, coronavirus. So they did not do the sequencing themselves, but they used the sequences which are available in the database. And what they found is that there are some strains which are uh, being more prevalent than the others, all right? And if you look at the table, uh, you, you'll go to the bottom of the table, there's this strain A2A. And out of all the sequences, the prevalence of A2A is the most. So the A2A uh, has surfaced as the most prevalent or more, most penetrating and the most infecting viral strain, which has emerged in the human population, all right? And this is a representation of uh, uh, this viral strains. As you can see here, that A2A has actually taken over of all viruses. And uh, so the gray is great. <laughs> Finally. OK, so uh, yeah. talking about the phylogenetic network, uh, the same group showed that uh, the one sequence, that is the O sequence, uh, as uh, represented here in the uh, with the, with the uh, and gray bubbles, they are they're the, they're the starter, right? They they initiated the process, uh, so they first infected the humans, and within these humans, so they changed their nature drastically. And uh, finally, the strain A2A has taken over, as you can see. Majority of the viruses are belong to the A2A uh, group, and uh, I'm just skipping this slide, and as you can see, this is the geographical distribution of these viruses. Uh, as uh, I already told, that W uh, O is the uh, first Wuhan virus that appeared in December 2019, and as the time progressed, uh, the O virus spread it all over the world. B made its appearance in January in few places. Uh, I think Europe uh, and uh, America and Southeast Asia, and so is the B1. But then, as you can see, that A2A first made its appear appearance in January, and then it started spreading all over the world, and now it is the most prevalent form. But uh, there's an interesting fact that uh, the viruses, even in a particular geographical location, all are also different. For example, in USA, there are uh, different viruses, different strains of the viruses are circulating. And in Washington, the B1 strain is the most prevalent one, whereas in New York, it's the H2A. And this is true for other uh, geographical locations. I'll just give an example of four here, uh, US, Spain, UK, Canada. For example, in UK, uh, the ancestral thread that is the O thread is present in wells, uh, the, uh, Maximum uh, at maximum penetration, whereas uh, uh, in England, uh, both the A1A and A2A are the prevalent one, and most prevalent is of course the A2A. So, what are the current treatment regions, and what are the ongoing research which are going on? So, as I told you, that there's still no clinically proven uh, effective antiviral therapy uh, that are available uh, against SARS-CoV-2. 
So there's Sapori Scare. Uh, what is Sapori Scare? Sapori Scare, the, the Brazilian treatment where a patient comes and the, the patients are given the line, uh, their uh, good health conditions. Uh, sometimes they're put on ventilators. And the, the doctors try to treat with some random medications with recovery no interferons and sometimes antibiotics if they find any signs and symptoms of bacterial infection and they're put on oxygen. So these were basically the treatments which were advised by WHO for MERS. So uh, this uh, treatment regime has been adopted by the uh, medicals uh, to treat the SARS-CoV-2. So what is the future? The future is the development of new vaccines, uh, drug screening, and host-directed therapy. So of course, for the first two, you're very familiar with. You know, vaccine development, of course, we know that we get vaccinated in order to uh, get uh, the best level of immunity, so that if you're challenged with a virus or a bacteria, you already have the immune cells ready, prepared to combat the viruses or the bacteria. So, uh, the entire world is now looking forward to the development of an effective vaccine which would prevent the contraction of uh, coronavirus infection. Many of, them, many of them are in clinical trial, but uh, the success stories uh, have not come out yet. This is followed by drug screening. So what happens if the virus has already infected a person? So the vaccine is for protection, for protecting an individual from getting the infection. And uh, the drugs are the ones uh, which are really effective, which are the uh, arsenals uh, to fight the virus when a person uh, vac vaccinated or not uh, has got the infection. So how to ward off the viruses which, are, which are already invaded the, virus, invaded the body? So only uh, we need uh, good drugs drugs that can uh, clear out the viruses from our body and also the drugs which can reduce the severity of the disease. That is also very important and also uh, with our pain and uh, the miseries. The most interesting part is the host directed therapy, which uh, the world is not talking about right now because uh, of uh, the shortage of uh, time and resources. So what happens? Uh, for the virus is that the viruses mutate very fast, because, and especially if the viruses are RNA viruses, like uh, flu, uh, dengue, Ebola, Zika, HIV. So these are all RNA viruses, and so is SARS-CoV-2. Why SARS-CoV-2 has become so deadly? Because its uh, genome is RNA, and as you know, that RNA is uh, highly prone to mutations. And what happens in the viruses is the reassortment, which also makes the mutation very rapid. Uh, and uh, most of the viral mutations are deadly for the virus itself. But some of the mutations might give the virus some advantage uh, to infect their host cells with more uh, effectiveness, with, with more vigor. So this in this scenario, the viruses become very deadly, very dangerous. Uh, what is then host directed therapy? Host directed therapy is a kind of therapy where we do not target the viral encoded proteins. We do not target the virus itself. Rather, we target our own genes or our own proteins, which provide assistance uh, to the virus uh, to establish infection. Remember, the virus is an inert mass of lipid protein and genetic material. So it does not have any science of life. It cannot uh, have uh, its own metabolism. Neither does it have any uh, local uh, motory uh, activity, uh, or it cannot replicate itself. Right. So it has to extract uh, assistance uh, from the host cells. And host-directed therapy uh, specifically uh, targets those genes which provide assistance to the virus. And last but not the least is the plasma therapy. What is plasma therapy? So you have uh, seen that many, uh, there are many coronavirus patients of, uh, who recovered, who successfully recovered from coronavirus. So how could they recover and other could not, other die? 
So one of the reasons is that the virus entered their body, but and and to make them sick. But their uh, their immune cells were uh, strong enough to mount a response against the virus. And what is that response? The response could be direct, that is, the cells are coming and directly destroying the virus, or uh, some memory cells are formed which are making some bullets, magic bullets, which are called antibodies. So these antibodies producing cells, are called B cells, are there in the body of an infected individual. So if you can take the plasma from the infected individual who is recovered, uh, their plasma should have a high amount of the antibodies which can neutralize the SARS coronavirus. So this is called plasma therapy. So plasma therapy is also being uh, quite effective nowadays and uh, many uh, hospitals are trying out plasma therapies, taking plasma from the recovered patients. Now, at the end, I'll just give you the summary of what is going on. So there have been a uh, total of uh, 41 diagnostics of which uh, have been authorized by the regulatory authorities, such as FDA in India, it's ICMR. Uh, there are different diagnostic tests, but the test, the most authentic uh, test to detect the virus is still the Ravis transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, or in short, it is called RT-PCR. But the problem with RT-PCR is that it's very laborious, very time-consuming, and very costly. So uh, just to give an example, uh, we are very, very soon we are going to initiate testing here in uh, Isra Mohali, and we just estimated the cost of testing. Uh, so if you do 500 tests per day, then the total cost for, uh, for a month test would be around one crore rupees. So this is this is the overall cost of, of RT PCR. So very soon we have to uh, come up with uh, a, a more convenient and uh, less expensive uh, a testing method that would give the results very quickly and that would not involve uh, much labor and uh, the reason cost will also go down. So so there are many there are people are scientists around the globe. They're trying to come up with different diagnostic uh, tools, uh, which are currently undergoing uh, uh, validation in different labs. Then coming to treatments, there are 23 drugs which are under clinical trial right now. So I'll come to the details of uh, this drug. And there are several vaccines. And out of uh, this vaccine, uh, five are showing a very good effect. So five are showing a very promising effect. But uh, there are many claims that we have discovered a vaccine against the SCOV2, which uh, means nothing uh, uh, to me because uh, the vaccines must uh, pass through all the uh, clinical trials, which takes about uh, a year or so. So unless or until we have all the results of the clinical trials, we cannot say that uh, we have finally got a vaccine against the coronavirus. And uh, to keep in mind that most of the uh, drugs and vaccines uh, fell at this stage of clinical trials, right? So coming to diagnostics, uh, there are different diagnostic tests which are uh, based on uh, different methods, uh, be it polymerase chain reaction, PCR, uh, uh, or next generation sequencing, isothermal application, uh, I'm sorry, amplification. And uh, yeah, I'm not going into the details, but there are also some uh, tests uh, which are have been discontinued, like uh, you know, the uh, rapid antibody test. Uh, the sensitivity was very low, that's why uh, India finally decided to discontinue with the test. Treatments so, there are different ways to treat the COVID patients. It, you can treat the symptoms, you can uh, uh, treat the inflammation. Because what happens here when the virus enters the body, there's this cytokine storm which is produced, the, the, the immune response becomes overzealous. And this overzealous, overwhelmed immune response mounts uh, a huge um, uh, uh, you know, cytokine release response that is called the cytokine storm. And that, in fact, uh, destroys our own uh, cells and own uh, organs. And then it becomes dangerous. So many anti-inflammatory uh, medications are now being uh, tried on humans so that the 
uh, extent or, or, or the vigor of this immune response is uh, modulated, they're toned down uh, so that a, a person or, uh, or a patient uh, can be saved at the end. And there's another method that is uh, antiviral growth. So here we are directly targeting the virus because the virus is dependent on its proteins. And once you target uh, uh, this viral protein, then uh, the viruses cannot propagate. So this is the antiviral growth. So about 30 uh, plus uh, drugs are in a clinical uh, trial, uh, sorry, in the preclinical stage. And as you can see here at the bottom of the slide that uh, there are different uh, uh, drugs which are currently being uh, tested uh, through the clinical trials, be it phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, and there's one in the phase four. And coming to vaccine, there are 41 different kinds of vaccines, and some are DNA-based, some are inactivated, uh, some are depending on the live attenuated viruses, non-replicating viral factors, protein cyanide, RNA, virus-like uh, particles, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, this is a list of all the vaccines which are currently being uh, tried, which are uh, in phase uh, one, two, three clinical trials. And the first one that showed promise to prevent uh, coronavirus infection was the one that was uh, discovered by Moderna. So what they're doing here, so they're injecting the mRNA uh, of the virus uh, so that the M and inside and this mRNA, if you just inject it like this, uh, the mRNA will be degraded in the human body. So what they're doing, they're encapsulating this mRNA with a lipid molecule, with a lipid envelope, and then they're injecting uh, this uh, lipid uh, nanoparticle, encapsulating the mRNAs into the human body, and this lipid then integrates, this lipid fuses with the Post cell membranes injecting this mRNAs. And this mRNAs, once it reaches a host cell, this mRNAs are transcribed and translated, and the proteins are released in the bloodstream. And this proteins then generate the immune response. And the objective is that the B cells are formed, uh, memory B cells, which will recognize, which will uh, make a lot of uh, antibodies against SARS CoV 2. So when a person gets the scope 2, then this antibody as well neutralize uh, the viruses so that uh, the person, even if he has few virus particles, the body is now equipped to war of the viruses. So there are other methods. I'm not going into the details here. So there are adenovirus-based methods. Uh, there are lentiviral-based methods, uh, so on and so forth. And these are the drugs which are currently being trialed. So, uh, the very famous drug is hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. It's also uh, named as a Trump uh, drug, uh, but uh, WHO stopped it, but they again started its clinical trial. Uh, one of the drugs that showed very nice effect is the remdesivir. It's an adenosin analog and it, it prevents the viral growth. Uh, lupinavir, ritonavir went to the clinical trial, but the uh, trial failed. So this were the drug targeting HIV-1. So there was a lot of enthusiasm in the very beginning that uh, these viruses would uh, uh, kill. Uh, sorry, the, the, the drugs will kill the virus, but uh, unfortunately, these uh, drugs did not show uh, much promise. Okay, so here I stop. And uh, I'm done with my uh, viral part. And uh, uh, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, we started our lab uh, in 2017, about three years ago. And this is uh, the website of my lab. You're welcome to visit it. And uh, there are many people who are interested uh, in doing research later in their life. And uh, you can consider joining Isa Mohali, joining my lab. This is my current group. and uh, one of uh, the alumni is with me. He is not there in the picture, though. Anurag, Anurag, this was. So he is uh, doing his integrated PhD here. So in Aisar Mohali, we have different programs, uh, like uh, 
So uh, we have different programs, integrated BSMS program, uh, where uh, in which uh, students can come after right after their 12th. Uh, it's, uh, it's an integrated program, and they can come through IIT, either IITG or KVPY, or ISER also conducts its own tests. All all the ISERs conduct the BSMS uh, entry uh, tests. And we have a very good PhD program. Uh, in PhD program, we also have postdoctoral program. So many of you would be interested uh, in research later in your life, so you might consider uh, ISER Mohali. And finally, I will show you beautiful pictures of our campus. As you can see, our labs, our academic blocks, and a very nice view of uh, Himalayas from our institute. With this, I hope that uh, we'll very soon find a cure and a vaccine. And uh, in the coming months, uh, I know that life has been very tough with all of us. The life has totally changed. It is not the same life that we used to enjoy even a few months ago. But uh, with the extensive research and collaboration between uh, medicals and the uh, scientists, uh, we are very hopeful that very soon they'll come up with uh, uh, with, with an efficient uh, vaccine strategy and a drug, and there will be sunshine very soon on the horizon. With this, I thank you all for listening to me, and uh, I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. May I audible? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, for an interesting and informative presentation. Thank now you. the session is open for the question and answer, and the speaker will be answering as many questions as the time permits. So I think uh, Madam Shidanto wants to ask any question. Okay, Madam, carry on. Dr. Banerjee, thank you for your seminar. It was pretty informative. I have one mm -hmm. very obvious question, and that is regarding men being affected more than women uh, with this virus. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, to start with uh, the fact that this virus enters using the ACE2 receptor, mm -hmm. and ACE2 receptor gene is actually present on the X chromosome. So there is a question of gene dosage twice in case of women compared to men. So does this have anything to do with the increased incidence of uh, infection in men compared to women? And if it is so, I'd just like to say a little bit more. Sorry, sir. And mm -hmm. if it is so, then it will be very interesting to see because ACE2 downregulation can jeopardize the RAS system leading to increased blood pressure volume and, uh, and leading to increased vascular permeability in the lungs, mm -hmm. which can actually pave a way for cytokine storm destruction. So I don't really see, I, even though in your drug list I saw, uh, you know, like that chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and uh, along with that you have shown that um, uh, it actually uh, inhibits ACE2 receptor. I really don't get that link. But I think people should focus more on this because ACE2 receptor downregulation can be compensated by S inhibitor. And if we can stop at this stage, then probably we can actually stop the immunopathogenesis, which is done by the cytokine storm. Am I saying right? I'm not sure. It's just a curious no. question. No, no, you're absolutely right. First of all, uh, I'm not very keen on the S2 receptor. The, exactly the reasons that you've had it, I completely agree with you. It's a very good point. I don't know about the dosage composition. That needs to be looked at. Uh, why the males are more susceptible to infection, that also needs to be looked at. Like, you know, the problem is we know so little about the virus and its pathophysiology, then it, it will be very difficult uh, for us to tease out what is exactly happening inside the cell or inside the body. Right. I agree with the S2 receptor that exactly the point that you raised, that hydroxychloroquine is probably down-regulating the S2 receptor. But uh, many people are saying that this is not the way that the virus can be blocked. The mechanism of hydroxychloroquine 
is on the lead endosomal compartment. So hydroxychloroquine is a lysosomal specific agent which uh, increases uh, the pH of lead endosome. So the viruses cannot fuse or penetrate at the lead endosomal, endosomal compartment and they remain trapped. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's a very good question, but unfortunately, I don't have any answer to it. And uh, hopefully, um, in the future, there'll be uh, more research on it and we'll have a, a more clear picture uh, to your question. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, there are several questions in the chat box. So, first question uh, is from Aniruddha Chatterjee. What is the percentage of asymptomatic uh, carriers infecting others for SARS-CoV-2 infection? And he so, also asked, can we expect similar percentage for COVID-19? What is COVID? Uh, uh, the first question is, what is the percentage of asymptomatic carriers infecting carriers? others for SARS-CoV-2 infection? Uh, hmm. So. Uh, to be honest, the numbers which I'll tell is most probably incorrect. Okay, so I have come to know uh, from several sources that the number of asymptomatic patients uh, is about 50% or even more. Okay, but uh, how many of the asymptomatic patients are shedding viruses? Uh, this I cannot uh, say with certainty, but it is now being told by the scientists who are working in this field that almost all of them, all of the asymptomatic carriers uh, have the capacity to shed the virus. So it should be 100% of the asymptomatic patients, but I don't know how true is it because the numbers are very volatile, so every day it is changing, but uh, there's evidence that almost all the asymptomatic patients uh, have the ability to shed virus. Okay, and uh, uh, next question from Devoshmita Shadu Khan and Gargi Shahakes. The questions are all the means almost the same. Mm -hmm. Is there any scientific correlation between the male gender and the coronavirus infection, or male are or male are more exposed to outer world and are more affected? Okay, it's again. Uh... Very good question. I would say that uh, whether the exposure of male to outside world makes them more vulnerable, makes them more uh, uh, makes them more at risk uh, to infection. So it was. I think when we do a statistical analysis, this confounding factor is also taken into account, and uh, going by the probability, uh, it seems that it is not only the you know, extent of the exposure because we are going outside more than females, which is actually not true nowadays. Huh? It would have, it would be true even like uh, uh, 50 years uh, back, but not now. So women and men, they are almost equally going outside, but uh, maybe the percentage would differ, but that is not reflected on the percent of males which are or who are being contracted uh, by the virus. So. Uh, again, I tell you that more research or more analysis would be required, more epidemiological studies would be required to uh, conclusively say something on this. Okay. Next question from Koel Nondi. What is the chance of reinfection of a person with a different SARS-CoV strain once the person has recovered from attack of one since it is highly mutable. Yes. Many people say that uh, you know, once you recover, there's hardly any chance of getting reinfected. But I totally disagree. I disagree because I've worked with influenza viruses, which is also very similar in structure and function. It's also a respiratory virus, and it's also an RNA virus. And this virus is also mutating at a very fast rate. So uh, to share, when, uh, uh, one of my personal experiences uh, when I was abroad, I was working on in, in terms of viruses and uh, uh, we had to take the flu, sh flu shot every year. So I remember that the flu shot used to uh, 
so there was a it was a kind of festival to take two shots because you know hundreds of people getting two shots on a single day. So I went and I got my flu shot, and uh, after a couple of months, I had the worst flu ever. So why? Because a new strain emerged, and I did not have protection against a new strain. So the same thing can happen for SARS-CoV-2. So even if we are recovering uh, from one particular strain, and now we see that the virus has already mutated so many times within a span of six months, that if it stays for at least a year or so, then it will have hundreds of different forms. And even if we have a, a very efficient vaccine or drug against the virus, uh, I'm pretty sure that there'll be a very high chance of getting reinfected. This is also true for dengue, for example. If you're getting uh, an infection with a dengue stereotype one, uh, that will not give you any protection against stereotype two. It will again make it your, make the, uh, infection work uh, by a process called antigen dependent enhancement. So if a person is already having a dengue infection with one strain and then he recovers, he or she recovers, and then uh, the same person gets a second strain of dengue, then will be at a higher risk of uh, developing a dengue hemorrhagic fever. So the same thing can happen uh, in case of SARS-CoV-2 because it's mutating at a very fast rate. Therefore, uh, in addition to getting a vaccine and drugs which are targeted against the virus, I think we should also focus on host vector therapies because our host proteins do not mutate uh, to that extent, and, but they're essential for the virus to establish infection. So uh, the emphasis should also be uh, there uh, to develop post-directed therapies. But having said so, I must also say that the vaccines, uh, even if they show promise, I would suspect that this virus, this vaccines will be seasonal only. So you need to get vaccinated every year, uh, like flu, and that also will not give you 100% protection. Okay. So next question from Srija Chakraborty. It is almost the same like the previous one. And he he was she was asking about that uh, there the number of different mutants or serotypes of SARS-CoV-2 are present. So mm -hmm. does this make reinfection possible? And another also, the can the second infection be more dangerous due to the antibody dependent enhancement? So there's a possibility. There's a possibility, but we don't know whether there'll be antigen dependent enhancement. What happens in the antigen dependent enhancement is. Uh, this is FC gamma receptor, right? And uh, the antibodies are present taken one strain and uh, in case of dengue, uh, and then this antibodies can very loosely recognize the second strain. But then these antibodies are recognized by the FC gamma receptors and they're internalized. Whether the same process is followed in case of SARS-CoV-2, uh, we don't know. We don't have any scientific evidence uh, for that. So we have to wait and see until uh, more research uh, is done uh, to see that whether similar effect is also seen uh, in the during the SARS-CoV-2 infection. Okay, so next question from Rishabh. While culturing the SARS-CoV-2 culture, is it possible that the culture shows positive for CPR but shows negative for PCR and why? I'm sorry, negative for? CPR and shows pos uh, neg positive for CPR but shows negative for PCR and why? Very unlikely, very unlikely because uh, RT-PCR is a very sensitive uh, technique. Okay, and if there's a virus, if uh, the virus is there, then the CPR will be there and also if you do RT-PCR, there's almost negligible chance that uh, RT-PCR would be negative. Okay, so there's another question from Simran Chopra. I went through a paper which states that dengue-prone dengue countries have low fatality rates plus higher recovery rate because there is a cross-reactivity of the antibodies to dengue, dengue virus and the coronavirus. Could you please tell me about in details? Okay, so yeah, one suggestion to all the students. Uh, 
that uh, SARS-CoV-2 has opened up uh, a new era of uh, scientific research here of very low significance. Okay, I'm not undermining any scientific research, but uh, there is a great uh, uh, variation in uh, their quality. So this kind of correlative studies are getting published nowadays in different journals. So you have to be very careful. I don't believe that it has got no scientific basis. Right, the antibodies, which are, antibodies are very specific. Yeah, and uh, if you are doing uh, immunohistochemistry, immunocytochemistry later in your life, I don't know like whether you're doing such experiments uh, during your bachelor's or master's, uh, uh, but you know that how specific the anti most of the antibodies are. So it's very unlikely that a dengue antibody uh, would cross-react with a SARS-CoV-2. So these are correlated studies, and these are totally based on numbers. And we know that how these numbers are extremely volatile. Every day the number is changing. So I don't believe in any correlative studies unless and until it is proven mechanistically. Okay. A question from Anushya Mandol. The viral proteins are being packed into the vesicles to be checked to the cell membrane surface to be assembled into viruses or does some other process take place in the vesicles? Yes, yeah, so what happens, these vesicles are formed and these vesicles can, so remember, this vesicle had a viral uh, genome, these vesicles also had the viral proteins. And the viral proteins which are membrane bound are also on the vesicles, but the proteins which are Need, which are needed to be complex with the genome are present within the vesicles. So once the RNA is produced and, R and the N NP or the, or the N protein, sorry, the N protein, uh, the nucleoprotein of such coronavirus, so it is also produced. And whenever they meet with each other, the RNA and the N protein, they get complex, right? The rest of the proteins, and uh, so there's of course the capsid protein, which is also present there. And the assembly is taking place in the specialized structures. And then the real assembly or the budding is taking place at the cell membrane. All right. So this specialized structure is acting like a sponge uh, to attract all the viral components. Because remember, the cell is, a, uh, is huge and it is composed of many proteins, many host proteins are there. So the virus has a tremendous task of uh, selecting its own protein out of the several thousand proteins which are present inside a cell. It's, it's, it's a massive task for the virus. It's a real challenge for the virus to only specifically uh, take its own protein. So one of the ways the virus does it is to upregulate the transcription of its own genes and downregulate the transcription of the host genes. Okay, they shut down the translation of the host proteins and thereby ensuring that only viral proteins are synthesized. But again, uh, in order to keep the cells in the functioning condition, the cells would need certain proteins to be present in the cell in abundant quantities. So from this pool of the proteins, it is a great challenge for the virus uh, to uh, almost sponge out its own uh, proteins or its assemblage. And that is happening at the specialized structure, which then helps in the virus in the subsequent uh, assembly and budding process. Okay. Sir, another question from B Biplav Kumar Bhomik. Uh, is there any possibility that CRISPR Cas system can get us an answer in a confirmatory viral RNA silencing system? Not too far uh, and uh, unaffordable, I suppose. So my counter question to uh, him is that uh, how, how so I did not get it. Uh, so what exactly? Could you please repeat the question. Is there any possibility that CRISPR-Cas system can get us an answer in a confirmatory or viral RNA silencing system? Viral RNA silencing system, uh, the viral, no, uh, I, I do not see uh, how to address this because uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is specifically designed to uh, knock out a particular gene, 
right, in the human cells. If you're, so these are guide RNAs, and the guide RNAs then will get confixed with Cas9, and they target our genome editing at the genome level. All right, not at the RNA level. The RNA level, if you really want to silence the viruses, you need to do RNAi. So remember, the CRISPR-Cas9 system works at the level of DNA. I, I, I don't know if I got the question correctly, mm -hmm. but this would be my answer. Okay, thank you, sir. So another question from Shatabdi Ghosh. The virus mm -hmm. has mutated quite a number of times. So in this context, do vaccines will reply? Uh, sorry, do vaccines uh, 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 will rely really come to help? Good question. So I think I already answered the question. So uh, the challenge would be, of course, to make a vaccine in the first place. The vaccine which will be universal. Uh, and uh, still, you know, influenza has been there for more than 100 years now, and uh, there's been a lot of emphasis in developing influenza vaccine. But how far are we successful there? So influenza vaccines is, are, are kind of seasonal. Why? Because we have failed to predict what, uh, what virus strain will be emerging uh, in future. And this could be true for SARS coronavirus. So we can have a vaccine. Uh, we'll try to have a vaccine which is universal, but uh, in reality, we might have to deal with the virus every year. So we might have to reformulate the vaccine so that, uh, you know, depending on the circulating strain, depending on the imaging viruses, we reformulate the vaccines every year. That would be very costly. And I'm very sad that uh, in economically challenged countries like India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and African uh, countries, how uh, visible would it be to vaccinate the entire population if we have to re, uh, reformulate the vaccine every time. Okay, thank so you, I sir. One, uh, I see one question which uh, I'd like to answer. Deep Banerjee is asking, do higher temperature UV rays or of sun kill the COVID-19 strain? Uh, so uh, it's very interesting because there's been a recent study from a French group that showed that uh, UV ray alone, for, or a brief exposure of UV ray, is not sufficient to kill the coronavirus. So you need at least uh, 92 degrees centigrade, and you have to treat uh, or keep the virus in that at that temperature for more than 15 minutes in order to uh, get rid of the virus. So a brief exposure to UV ray uh, may not kill the virus. Uh, instantaneously. It might take some time if you just keep it uh, or keep a, take a virus and keep it on, on the sun the entire day, then the virus might get damaged, but uh, nobody has done such experiments so far. Okay, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. So there are a lot of questions in the chat box, but uh, we do not have much time. So we have to discontinue the interactive session. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Banerjee, again. Now I request Shejuti to conclude today's session. Uh, with this, with, we have come to the end of our day one webinar. We are very much thank you, uh, thankful to Dr. Banerjee for discussing on prime issues of COVID-19 and answering many of our queries. We are thankful to him for taking time out of his busy schedule and, giving, and be here with us. Uh, we are also thankful to the participants for their uh, patient hearing, uh, for being with us. Uh, we are also sorry for the technical uh, problem that we had. But uh, since uh, this is the time of webinar, uh, this might be a part of uh, this system, continuing with webinars. Uh, with this, we have come to the end of today's day one session. Our next session is on 4th of July, and we hope to meet all our participants on the next day. Uh, our feedback link is active now. Uh, participants can submit their feedback, and it will be active till 11.59 tonight. Uh, so that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, again. Thank you. Thank it has really been my pleasure. Uh, you know, it's a pity that uh, uh, we have to do a webinar where most of uh, I cannot see the students uh, uh, of the yes. college, which uh, 
it is a pity I don't know like when I'll be able to meet them. Uh, but uh, this is how it is. As viruses change our lives so much so that uh, we have to depend on computers in order to communicate uh, with, with the students and the faculty. But anyways, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And uh, it's a special feeling, as I told you, that uh, I was a student. I was associated with Scottish Church for a long, long time. So I started also studying at Scottish Church College at school. Then I moved on to Scottish Church College. Uh, uh, I don't know if you're still continuing with the class two there. So I did also did my HS, high secondary in Scottish Church College. Okay. And then I continued there till my bachelor's. So it was a real pleasure for me. It has been a real pleasure for me uh, to be a part of this awareness series. And uh, I look forward to participation of uh, the students in research and uh, Scottish Church is a fantastic place. Uh, uh, so many memories associated with Scottish Church. Uh, I hope Chifuda is still there. Uh, uh, so, uh, and there are many memories. Uh, I, just because of the wonderful time, I am not sharing these memories right now. But uh, hopefully, they will come when we'll all be able to meet together. And I wish all the best to the Scottish family. And especially, I wish the students a very bright future. And uh, I encourage them, most of them, that, uh, to come to research and uh, contribute uh, to the welfare of, of our society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vanity. Thank you for accept accepting our invitation. And we also look forward to meet you again. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.